if you move into the area of ministry, meaning that you choose to step outside yourself to do something for someone else, that's what ministry really means. It's not so much being a pastor or an elder or deacon or whatever it may be that you think of and you have your own idea about. But when you move into ministry, you actually step outside of yourself. You're not seeking to take care of yourself, provide for yourself, get something for yourself, but that you're willing to turn your life inside out to give to someone else that which you have received. And that's what you'll eventually learn to define as ministry, stepping outside of yourself to help someone else. And when you do that, you're going to find that often you're going to go through challenges and perspectives you never would have dreamed possible, that you never would have thought that those whom you were arm in arm with suddenly want to disarm you, or that those that you thought were your tightest and closest friends will betray you, or that somehow you'll run into such frustrations and aggravations that you never would have imagined possible because you thought you were so tight and right with the Lord. Because you see, there is an essence of someone out there that wants to get you. <laughs> and we're not talking conspiracy theory here. <laughs> we're talking reality. There is an enemy of our soul. He wants to influence your emotions and cause your soul to be ripped from your body, so to speak, and led astray by your flesh to the way that he would have it to go, which is to be thinking of yourself, taking care of yourself, paying attention to yourself, protecting yourself, very self-oriented, self-actualization, self-acclimation. As a matter of fact, any time that you can use the word self and you can't put the word deny in front of it, guess what? That's the enemy of your soul. He's getting you to think of you first. One of the trickiest ways I really love to hear this is you have to love yourself first before you can love anyone else. No! <laughs> I have no clue how sneaky that is and how people bought into it because it's like, you are kidding, aren't you? You fell for that one? Man, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Buckle up my sleeves. Hey, we got a good one. Let me sell you some property. <laughs> I mean, come on. You got to love yourself. No, you don't. Give me a break. God loves you. You got to get a grip on where you're coming from. You don't come from your perspective. You come from his. If he's willing to die for you, there must be something good about you, eh? <laughs> maybe I can't see it, and maybe you can't either, but God can. So there you go. Get rid of this esteem and think of it from God esteem, not self esteem, and you'll get back to the right attitude and actions about what you should be. But you see, that enemy of your soul does want to turn you from outside in to inside out and turn it upside down so that you won't even know which way you're going around. Because he wants to keep you running in circles so you'll never get to the place of what God really has in store for you, which is ministry. You're always ministering. You know that. Come on. The moment you wake up, you influence everyone around you. God help some of us. Because <laughs> you're not exactly the best person in the morning, are you? <laughs> some of you. Oh, boy. But some of us, you know, we actually wake up joyful. Woo! Imagine that. That's a unique experience. My wife can't stand it. <laughs> she hates it when I wake up. Would you please go somewhere until I've woken up three hours later, you know? Like, you know, she gets up and then three hours later she's like into being woke up. You know, kind of like wide awake by then. Coffee, you know, hair in place, you know, and makeup on and, you know, feeling like, yeah, you know, a human being again. Okay. <laughs> I wake up, I'm like, yeah, let's go play. <laughs> I'm all over it. <laughs> but we all have different gifts and abilities. We all have different perspectives. We influence everyone around us in some way, in some particular way. It may be for good. Hey, that's cool. It may be for bad. Well, that's not so good. It may be in some way you don't see by way of some of the unseen things of the kingdom, whether prayer or whether through just attitudes. You know as well as I do that if you walked into a room with a bad attitude, somebody in that room is going to go, ooh, what's up with him? And they won't even know or what's up with her. And it won't be because you're all stiff, you know, and looking like you've got a bad attitude. No, it'll be just that you can feel the vibes coming off you, you know. And so there's something more to the unseen than what we realize. 
or maybe the word of God has already declared that it is true much of what we can't see influences of what we can see I mean one of the biggest examples of that is just an atom the atom obviously influences everything we could see because without an atom you wouldn't be here <laughs> poof you're gone no atom nobody <laughs> you're gone but the reality of knowing these things means that we have a challenge to face every day if you step into ministry you're going to be challenged every day not just by your routines because sometimes there's physical challenges sometimes there's an emotional challenge sometimes there's time challenges sometimes there's constraints there's leadings there's things that God is trying to teach you in a different way to look at from a different perspective but there's also the reality of knowing there is an enemy of your soul there is there is a influencer a liar, a thief, a robber who's coming after you. And he's called, you know, Lucifer in one occasion, and he can appear as Lucifer. He's known as, you know, Satan in another occasion, and he can appear as Satan. But he can come as an angel of light. He could come as a messenger of good news, supposedly, you know, except for just a little bit off. And that's kind of what he did with Jesus, you know, when he was tempting him, you know, of the devil, you know, to be when he was in the wilderness. Jesus already saw it coming because he knew ahead of time what was going to happen, but he also had to prepare himself according to the scriptures. And that's what you need to do if you're going to be in ministry. You need to prepare yourself to be attacked. Really, seriously. You need to not get, you know, a stiff upper lip or, you know, like some attitude, you know, like, hey, you know what? Somebody hits me on the right cheek, I'm going to deck them. <laughs> no, you need to expect you're going to get stabbed in the back, in the foot, in the head, in the eye, in the ear, in the mouth, in the nose. Matter of fact, you're going to get attacked from every direction you can possibly imagine. And if it isn't from your friends, it'll be from your enemies. If it isn't from your enemies, it'll be from your family. If it isn't from your family, it'll be from your fellowship. If it isn't from your fellowship, it'll be from somewhere. But one way or another, you're going to get compressed, distressed, and the only way to get released from all of that really is to, in my opinion, I take it a little different than most people. I take it with a sense of humor. <laughs> Come on, get it, take it, <laughs> wipe me out, I don't care. If God's in the first place, it'll be God's in the end. What do you think I'm going to do? Defend it? <laughs> God needs a defense? I don't think so. So, you need to kind of get partially a sense of humor, but also a perspective that makes you look at it from a better point of view than just, oh my God, this is too hard for me, I don't want to do it. No, you need to look at it from God's point of view. God offered in heaven, all the angels in heaven, everyone standing around, you know, and he's going, hey, you know, the people are beginning to get way off track. Matter of fact, they're heading so far out into left field, I'm going to get rid of the field, and I'm going to change it into something else. Hell, because <laughs> we have to enlarge hell, so we're going to have to, you know, redevelop, you know, some of that plot land that we had out there, and it used to be left field, you know, and they've gotten so far out in the left field, now we're just going to, you know, move the boundaries, and guess what, hell's going to take up that left field, and we're going to put everybody out in right field if they could get over there, but guess what, we need to do something about those people that are out in left field, because if they stay where they're at, they're going to wind up in hell. So who go? Who can we tell? Who can we warn them that we're redeveloping hell into a bigger place, and that we need to get them out of there, because they're already headed there, and they need to move. They need to get out of the plot relocation and the boundary lines of where we placed hell at because guess what? Redevelopment has come and they're going there. So Jesus says, hey, I'll tell them. I'll warn them. Send me. And he did. <laughs> and you know the rest of the story. Well, guess what? Some people moved out of left field. Some people are still out there. Oh, well, I think about the time when it comes to be consumed. It'll be consumed. Oh, boy. I don't think you want to be in left field when left field turns into the wrong kind of field you want to be in. But the field that you were called to go into is ripe with harvest. It's out in right field, you know. They kind of redeveloped that into some farmland, you know, and they, they made it kind of neat, you know. They put some furrows in it, you know, and it's kind of like long rows. It's got some corn growing. It's got some peas, you know. It's got all this kind of like neat stuff growing up. And all you need to do is go out and pick it. Now, I don't want you going out and picking fruit that isn't ripe. Now, you know, I know some of you get excited and you think that you got to pick a tree when it's still a vine, or you got to pick a vine when it's becoming a tree, or you need to do something weird. But if you learn in ministry to pick the fruit in its time, then let me tell you something about fruit. When it's picked, vine ripened, it's delicious. When it's picked early, it's going to grow. Not quite so sweet. Not quite the same. But vine ripened, oh my God, how delicious it is. 
that's what ministry is like. You got to learn how to grow things, you know, not just beat them down, not just slap them around, not just stomp on them and romp on them because you're feeling bad that day and you think that, oh, well, I'm going to take it out on someone. No. You see, when you move into ministry, you really want people to move ahead of you and you want to prefer them above yourself. You want to learn to deny yourself and be a servant undergirding someone else's effort to help them to go closer to the Lord so they can become all they were meant to be. I do that with my garden all the time. I mean, if you look around, you see these plants? Man, these plants would not be growing because they were out in the field and they were getting ready to be mowed. So I snatched them out before they got mowed. I took them out of left field and I planted them into my right field, which actually happens to be over to my right or on your camera angle, stage left, so to speak. But the point is, now I have them. Ah, I rescued them out of the field. And you see, they got clay in there and they got dirt, you know. And yeah, I need to give them some better soil, you know, so they'll grow better. But hey, they're blooming. I transplanted them. I brought them into my garden so that they would grow. And that's kind of what ministry does. You want to transplant, you know, those things that maybe someone's got some little, you know, kind of weird things and weird ideas, but, you know, so what? You bring them into a place where they can grow and they'll grow up and fulfill that which God has destined them to be. And once you start to see the fruit, when you see tomatoes growing on that tomato plant, you'll know it's a tomato plant. When you see that, you know, like fruit tree, you know, it looks kind of orange, you know, and you bite into it, you know, after it's gotten all nice and bright and orange, you ain't going to call it a lemon. <laughs> oh, well. But that's the point of why in ministry you choose to administer your ministry in the right time, the right place, and the right way. Because God wants you to be a ministry yourself. You yourself are a ministry. You always have been, you always will be. That's just the way it is. You influence everyone around you. So knowing that, then you need to get out of yourself and move yourself into the place of ministering to other selves than yourself. And that's kind of what devotionals do. They'll help inspire you to conspire inside of you that direction you need to go so that it'll point you in the place to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Instead of maybe, as I just kind of like saw someone doing, pardon me, but I know the guy was a shepherd. Now, I know that because he called himself a shepherd. He says, hey, I'm a shepherd. He says, but you know what? I'm beating my sheep because they just ain't doing what I told them to. And I thought, how many sheep have you had? And he said, well, you know, I, I, I got a few sheep. You know, I said, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, you got... You got a few sheep, you know. And so, what are you doing with your sheep? Are you feeding them? Well, yeah, you know, they're, I'm feeding them, but they, they, they're not multiplying. Well, what are you feeding them? Well, you know, the, the normal stuff. You know, I thought, well, okay. Have you tried, like, you know, maybe giving them some abnormal stuff? You know, like maybe grain instead of, you know, grass? You know, because you can, you can take sheep, you know, you can take sheep to the, you know, valley, you know, and feed them grass. Or you give them grain, you know, you give them different things, you know, that'll kind of like boost them up. Have you given them some vitamins, you know? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I got a lot to do, you know. I mean, I, I feed them, you know, but they got to they, they gotta grow on their own, you know. Like, okay, you know, so, so so tell me about the sheep. Well, you know, they just they just aren't, you know, multiplying like I want them to. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of like, you know, I'm just frustrated, that's all. It's not really a sheep's fault, it's my fault. So you're beating the sheep because you're frustrated. I said, well, yeah. I said, you sure you're not raising goats? Because if you beat a sheep and the sheep put up with it, I don't think they're sheep anymore. I think they're goats. And you know what you do with goats? You actually take a stick and you have to kind of knock them around a little bit because they keep getting, getting into things and eating everything in sight. Big difference between sheep and goats, and a lot of it has to do with what you're doing to them. So unless you want your sheep to turn into goats, I think you better quit doing what you're doing and maybe take care of the sheep instead of beating the goats, you know, just doesn't seem like the right move to do. He knoweth the way that I take. Believer, what a glorious assurance. The way of thine, this way of yours, this it may be a crooked, mysterious, tangled way, this way of trial and tears. He knows it. The furnace seven times heated, he lit it. 
There is an almighty guide knowing and directing our footsteps, whether it be to the bitter Mara pool or to the joy and refreshment of Elam or Elim, which is actually kind of like a you know phonetic way of saying it, which is closer to the Hebrew. Elim, Elam. That way, dark to the Egyptians has its pillar of cloud and fire for his own Israel. The furnace is hot, but not only can we trust the hand that kindles it, but we have the assurance that the fires are lighted not to consume, but to refine. And that when the refining process is completed, no sooner and no later, he brings his people forth as gold. Fire up that furnace seven times hotter. Go ahead, see if I care. Ta -ha. <laughs> I'm with the Lord. When they think him last near, he is often nearest. When my spirit was overwhelmed, then thou knewest my path. Do we know of one brighter than the brightest radiance of the visible sun, visiting our chamber with his first waking beam of the morning, an eye of infinite tenderness and compassion, following us throughout the day, knowing the way that we take, and the way we are, and the way we should move, and the way we grew, and the way we do what we do when we do what we do? Which is most of the time, doo doo. Bag it. The world in its cold vocabulary in the hour of adversity speaks of providence, the will of providence, the strokes of providence. Providence, what is that? Why dethrone a living, directing God from the sovereignty of his own earth? Why substitute an inanimate, death like abstract in place of his acting, controlling, and personal decision for your life, knowing every hair on your head is counted and every direction of every action of every circumstance is held by him doing it with you, to you, around you, and through you? So, quite frankly, what are you learning from it? He did it. You mean, the devil did it isn't a good idea, but God did it is a good idea? Could be. You may want to think that one through. The devil don't have that kind of power. Oh well. How it would take the sting from a goading trial to see what Jacob or what Job saw in his hour of aggravated woe when every earthly hope lay prostrate at his feet. No hand but God's was on upon him. He saw that the hand behind the gleaming swords of the Sabians, he saw it behind the lightning flash, he saw it giving wings to the careening tempest, he saw it in the awful silence of his rifled home. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thus, and therefore, seeing God in everything, his faith reached its climax when this once powerful prince of the desert, seated on his bed of ashes, could say, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If God is in control of everything, he's in control of nothing. 